Good morning and welcome to our Easter celebration service. Although we normally would be wanting to be gathered together in the sanctuary, singing hymns of praise and worship to Jesus on this, the anniversary, uh, the celebration of his resurrection. Um, because of COVID, we're still continuing to be home and trying to find other ways to continue to meet and worship together and to be the church for one another, but also for our community. And so I would pray that in this time that you would uh, continue to find ways to serve the Lord, um, to serve one another and to love our neighbors as ourselves. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's read the scriptures together today. And we often look at uh, historical passages that talk about the actual uh, resurrection this Sunday morning. And, you know, Mary coming to the tomb and then Peter and John rushing to see an empty tomb. And, but today we're going to change our, um, what we're going to look at. We're not going to look at the historical passages, but we're going to look at what the uh, apostles, what uh, Paul in particular, has to tell us about the importance of the resurrection and what it means for us today. What did they interpret that to be? And what did they teach about the resurrection for us today? And so we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. And Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him. In fact, if in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life, we have hope in Christ. We are all of all people most to be pitied. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Let's pray. Father, we would come to you this morning 
And through these words of your scriptures, might your spirit come and make them alive in us again today. Might they renew our spirits, our faith, our hope in you, our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name and to his glory. Amen. So we celebrate a number of things around the life of Jesus. Today we're celebrating the resurrection, which is a, a joyous time, a great time of celebration, an empty tomb. While Christmas is the beginning of the story of Jesus' life here on earth, Easter is viewed kind of as the pinnacle of his life, the culmination of what he'd come to accomplish through his life here on earth, our salvation, our adoption as children of God. We celebrate with joy at his birth and also rejoice in his being raised to life again by God the Father. In between, in between just three days ago, we remembered the cross the place where the sacrifice of his life was made. And we're so focused on the horror of his treatment and, and the manner in which he died that sometimes we're inclined to find it really hard to have joy in the cross and the death of Christ. So our celebration of Good Friday is often very somber. And so we go from celebrating the life and birth of Jesus with, and the joy of that that it brings to us to, to sorrow and then back to joy again over the course of a weekend. But there is another perspective of the cross that we often fail to recognize. Paul brings real clarity to this when he writes in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. He says, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. That is the essence of the story of the cross and what God accomplished there. New life and sins forgiven. But Paul goes on and puts a little different perspective on it. And he says this, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, rather than seeing Jesus as victim of the power of the Sanhedrin and the Romans and the soldiers, here Paul shows us Jesus as the victor, having disarmed those powers and authorities. If we envision the cross as a throne, envision the cross as a throne, it might help us to see this perspective. The perspective of Christ on his throne sitting in triumph over those powers and people that had placed him there the cross as his throne, where he brings ridicule and disgrace upon them, at the same time that they were thinking the exact opposite, that, that they were actually triumphing over Jesus, and they were getting away with a problem, bringing it to an end by having him crucified. When we have this perspective of the cross, the cross as a crown and as a victor and as triumph, then it becomes something to equally celebrate with his birth and resurrection. Since they're all part of God's redemptive plan for us. Perhaps it's only in hindsight that we can now look back after the resurrection with the perspective of an empty tomb and a risen Savior that we can experience joy in the cross. And so while we normally read through historical accounts, today we want to focus on this passage that Paul brings to us. 
about the meaning of the resurrection and how important it is for us to understand and grasp how fundamental it is to what our faith is and what the resurrection has accomplished for us. Paul begins by writing to them, and it's really a reminder. Now, we all need reminders once in a while. Actually, I think for many of us that have been in the church for a long time, hearing another sermon, hearing another message is, is really no more than a reminder of something that we have heard before. But we always want the Spirit of God to take that message and renew it in our hearts and our lives. And I think that's what Paul was attempting to do. He was reminding them about something that he had spoken to them in the past. And so even more than just wanting to remind them of his message, he wants to remind them of how they responded to it. And he begins by saying, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you firm, hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Paul's reminding them that they've been on this journey together. He did the preaching. They received the truth of that message. And they have taken a stand on that truth. They have input, put it into their lives and had it impact their lives. Now, to, to take a stand is an expression that we're all pretty familiar with, but when you look at the exact you know, definition of what it means, it says that to take a stand on something is to publicly assert, publicly assert one's unyielding support of, defense of, or opposition to something. Can you recall when there's been a time in your life when you had to take a stand on something? You really felt you had to take a stand? If, if you try to dissect that experience, you'll find that what drove you to that place was a very strong belief in something, a commitment to something that you could not allow yourself to waver from, a principle. And whether it was in support of something or in opposition to it, you can probably feel the emotions that were attached to that experience even sense the tension in your body as you literally took your stand. This idiom also has kind of a military sense to it of holding one's ground against an enemy. And Paul is, is saying that they've confirmed this in their own actions. They have taken a stand. And he refers to the message as being of first importance. The message that they've taken this stand on is of first importance. In other words, of, of all the things that they've been preached about, all the things they've heard, all the things they will hear. It is because of the resurrection, because of the gospel, is the primary message that you need to take a stand on for your life. What Paul is reminding us about is something that is fundamental to whom we are and the impact it has in our life. In fact, it is the gospel, the good news by which we are saved. And we need to continue to stand on this gospel. He then goes on to outline what this gospel message is. Just again, reminds them of the truth of the message. And he begins with an outline by making it really clear that it's something that he's not made up on his own. This isn't his message, but rather it's a message that he has received. A message he's received that he's passing on to you and to us today. And the message is consistent with scripture as well. And it really is the consistency with scripture that actually 
provides the message with its authority. It's the scripture that gives the message the authority, not the messenger. And so what follows is a, a simple yet powerful explanation of the work of Christ that's described in four specific actions that he took. Died, buried, raised, and then appeared. Let's look at each of these just independently first. And the first fact is that Jesus died. There were certainly many witnesses to the fact that Jesus was nailed to the cross after being tried and beaten by the Sanhedrin and the Romans. And all of history confirms who the players were in this brutal act. Pilate, Annas, Caiaphas, they're all historical figures that other records of history, not just the scriptures, point to. And so there's no question about the historical Jesus and the fact that this is how he met his end. He was crucified on a cross. And this is also something that's easy for anyone to grasp that Jesus died. After all, it's a very human experience. We all realize this is how life ends. We die. And it might be glorified like in the uh, Lion King that it's the circle of life and we're born, we live, and we die. But it is familiar for us. But there's much more to the story of Jesus dying. As Paul states, he says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So the importance of Jesus' death has incredible significance for us beyond the end of his physical life. It, it had a more significant purpose, a purpose given by God and confirmed by the scriptures. It was an essential part of the redemptive work of God in making a way for us to be reconciled with our creator. It was the pathway that Jesus had to trod. The second part that Paul talks about was that Jesus was buried. And both, both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took Jesus' body down from the cross and prepared it for burial as was their normal customs. And after wrapping his body with about 75 pounds of spices and, and strips of cloth, they placed him in a nearby tomb, and that is where his body remained for three days, guarded by Roman soldiers. But death, both death and burial are, are they're common experiences for all of humanity, and in so many ways there's nothing out of the ordinary or spectacular in Jesus' death and burial. In fact, we all know that if we had experienced the same punishment, in our bodies, we know that we would have died as well and been buried just like Jesus. But then comes the next part that we're not familiar with, the part that's unique, the part that is the miracle that challenges all of our thinking. The third part is that Jesus was raised on the third day and again, according to the scripture. Now we've completely stepped outside the boundaries of our ordinary human experience. This is the one thing that we have no personal way to relate to. We know all kinds of people that have died, family, friends, parents, maybe even children. And we know them. We know that they're gone and they've been buried. But we have no human experience of someone being raised from the dead. And neither did the people of the New Testament, apart from the few people like Lazarus, that Jesus himself raised from the dead. This is the miraculous part of the story that goes beyond even our wildest imaginations. That is why Paul goes on to talk about 
the next part of the story of the life of Jesus, because this part is just not rational. It is hard for anyone to grasp. It's impossible to believe. So the important part of this fifth aspect is that he calls witnesses to the story. It's not just his message. There's witnesses to the story. And so in the fourth part, he says that Jesus appeared after his resurrection, first to Cephas, Peter, then the 12 disciples, and then finally to more than 500 men and women at the same time. So it wasn't just individuals or a small group of people. It was a crowd of people that could bear witness to this. And, and Paul, if he was speaking today, he would go on and say, I can give you their names. I can give you their address. I can give you their phone number. I can give you their email address. You can check this out for yourself because most of these people are still alive today and they can bear witness to the fact that Jesus lived died, was buried, but rose again. He also appeared to his brother James. And we read in the gospel that James really was reluctant to believe that his brother, the kid that grew up with him, that older brother, was actually the Messiah, not just a carpenter's son. And then he appeared to the rest of the apostles, Paul tells us those that larger group of disciples that followed around Jesus and were witnesses to his life, his death, burial, and resurrection, those other additional apostles. And finally, he gets around to say that Jesus appeared to him, to Paul, and he appeared in that light on the road to Damascus and spoke directly to Paul and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what to do. Paul humbly declares in the verses that follow that compared to all the other witnesses, he considers himself to be the least of the apostles, really unworthy in fact, doesn't even consider himself to be an apostle because he had persecuted the church. But for Paul, the important thing is the message, not who has delivered it. The important thing is the message, not who you have heard it from. It's the message that you believe, not the messenger. This is really an important principle for us to remember and reflect on. Sometimes, especially in a situation like this, where we're kind of at home with our TVs and the internet, we may very well be spending a lot more time in prayer or reading our Bible, but we would also likely spending some time watching TV or listening over the internet to other preachers or teachers and Sometimes we get enamored with a certain preacher, with, with his way of delivering a sermon, or we also read their books and, and we, we begin to regard them in such a way that uh, we can fail to discern the truth of what their message actually is. Jesus provided lots of warnings to us about false prophets that we still need to be aware of and judge the message that they speak by the truth how it aligns with scripture that's been revealed and also reflect on how they live that out themselves. We've had so many unfortunate instances of people in leaders, leaders in our churches, leaders in our faith community that have fallen, that haven't really lived out the gospel and it's heartbreaking to see and hear so for Paul, the message is what's important. The truth of what has been preached is of utmost importance, not the one who's delivered, delivered the message, whether it was him or another apostle or whoever.
Paul goes on to address an issue that is, uh, seems to have cropped up within the Corinthian church along with a number of other issues that he's already dealt with. The, the Corinthian church was a place that was really struggling to get it right. And so now he brings up another issue for them. And the issue is that, you know, if you've been preached and taught that Christ has risen from the dead, how can it be that there's people among you saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, maybe there was a remnant of the, the disagreement that had lasted uh, between Pharisees and Sadducees, where Pharisees believed that there would be a future resurrection of the dead, and, and the Sadducees didn't believe it. And maybe that had infiltrated or kind of painted its way into their community. But Paul makes it really clear that everything, the, the essence of the gospel message, hinges on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he states in no uncertain terms that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, then there's a whole lot of things that would be different and untrue that they've preached about. And so if Jesus had not risen from the dead, the first thing, first thing he says is that our preaching and your faith is in vain. It's absolutely useless. It's just nothing more than hot air. For him, he sees himself personally as, I've been a liar, a false witness be about God, because I've testified that it was God himself that raised Jesus from the dead. The third thing he says is that if the dead aren't raised, then God didn't raise Jesus either. If there is no resurrection, then God hasn't done that work and won't do it. He goes on and says, your faith is futile. You are still lost in your sinful life. There is no redemption for you. There's no reconciliation with your father. Then he turns to those who have already died in hopes of a future resurrection. And he says, for them, if there's, Jesus hasn't been raised, then they're just lost. They're in for a big disappointment because that's the end. Their hopes are gone. And finally, he says, if our hope in Christ is just for this life and not for a future eternity, then we should be pitied more than anyone else. Rather than having hope, our faith and life would be hopeless. Hopeless. Paul then follows his series of conjectures with a very big but. A very big but. Rather than being hopeless, there is hope. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Consider all the witnesses to this, and you cannot deny it. He is the first of many that will follow him. And then Paul draws on the example of Adam and compares him to the contrasting work of Christ. He says that through Adam's sin, death came into the world, and because of that, we all die. But in the same manner, the resurrection of the dead also comes through one man, through the work of Jesus Christ, and through him, all will be made alive. Because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we have a guarantee of new life in him and with him, undoing the consequences of Adam's sin. Now, I don't know how you feel or think about Adam, but I know for me, I sometimes view him with a, a touch of anger or at least incredulity, wondering how he could have blown things so badly. He'd been given everything he needed and placed within a garden where God himself would walk and commune with him and eat, knowing only good. I'm guessing that some of you may remember Laurel and Hardy from the 1930s, and I won't ask you to put up your hand 
uh, to identify yourself like I might have in church. But even if you don't remember from the 30s, you're, you're maybe like me, I mean, you've seen them on TV. And, and my experience of them really was kind of the cottage because we could only get one station from Barry, and it seemed that their programming in those days really only consisted of reruns of old shows like Laurel and Hardy and, and other things that, you know, and we were watching on a black and white TV, so it didn't matter. And it never failed that no, no matter what those two guys were trying to do and getting into, they, they never quite seemed to get things right. And they, they would get messed up and, and Oliver Hardy would look with disgust at his partner, Stan Laurel, and repeat these words that we all really know well. This is another fine mess you've gotten us into. This is another fine mess you've gotten us into. And like Oliver Hardy, we like to blame Adam for his actions in that garden, for the mess he has gotten us into. But the truth is that even though, even though these same words might express my feelings towards Adam, we all realize that I managed to sin enough on my own. And even if I'd been in Adam's shoes, that's if he had any at the time, I would have done exactly the same thing. The point Paul is driving at is that God's redemptive plan has been born, out of, born on the shoulders of one man, Jesus Christ. It's been him that has borne the responsibility of redeeming us from the actions of another one man, Adam. And God's made a way through Christ for us to return to the garden, so to speak, to enter into fellowship with our Creator, once again free from the guilt and burden of sin. Paul expresses this comparison between Adam and Jesus more fully in Romans 5, verses 12 to 21. And then in chapter 6, he goes further in discussing what being made alive in Christ really means to its fullest. And while our Corinthians passage focuses primarily on a future resurrected new life in eternity when Christ returns, here Paul focuses on the experience of a new life in Christ today and how we are empowered for the present. Paul writes to the Romans and he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that, so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin, who can, how, <coughs> excuse me, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, 
but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under law, but under grace. So Easter is a day to celebrate. Not just the historical facts of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but the fact that we can be united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Our joy is that we can live with him and live like him, living a life for God now, today, in his life. Our joy should be the same joy that Lazarus experienced of being brought out of the grave and brought back to life. Our joy and celebration then comes in thanksgiving and offering ourselves to God, offering him our life, every part of our being for him to use as an instrument of righteousness. That is the power of the cross and the resurrection, that our lives can be completely changed and reflect the life of Christ. Our joy and calling is now to appear, appear just like Christ did after his, resur his resurrection, to be witnesses. Maybe you need to appear as Christ to those who are closest to you, to family and friends, or even further to neighbors and in your community, or even further to the ends of the earth, as Jesus called us. Jesus calls us to be his witnesses, but not witnesses to just a historical story, but rather be living witnesses of a new life, a resurrected life, because we've been united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Because he lives, we too shall live. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And God bless. Happy Easter. The Lord is risen. Welcome back to my house. I have a few more hymns for you uh, after last week. I want to thank my father for singing with me. Um, he is a bit new to some of the hymns, so don't go too hard on him. Uh, the first hymn that we're singing is Christ Arose from the Blue Hymnal. 
hope you all enjoyed that. The next hymn that we're going to be singing is called Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, I have one more piece to send you out on your Easter Sunday. Have a good day.